it says we're old. Good evening. Appreciate everybody coming out to be with us this evening. Appreciate everybody joining us on the Facebook as well. We appreciate you coming out and being here tonight. <clears throat> appreciate you coming out to the house of the Lord. Do a couple of things. I just got a text message a few moments ago about uh, Judy Taylor. Uh, they had to rush her back to the hospital. She was coughing up some blood. And uh, they're taking her to Johnson City. That's, she had the uh, catheter down in her leg and it opened up with blockage. I'm not sure what's going on. I just got a text message about 10 minutes before I got here. So I remember her in the prayer. So if you get any information on that, we'll share it. Do remember her in your prayers. But I uh, do appreciate everybody coming out to join us tonight. I got tickled this morning. Uh, I didn't have my phone turned on for the Facebook Live. But everybody was looking at me like, should I tell him or should I not? <laughs> like I said, I kept looking at you and I thought to myself, maybe it's back yonder. Maybe you know, maybe he's not going to do it. But everybody else had the same look in my camp. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what was going on until it dawned on me. Oh, yeah, I ain't got a phone call. But sorry about that this morning. It was not intentional. I just completely forgot uh, this morning. Got my mind on other things uh, this morning. But uh, sorry about that. But we're, we're with it tonight. We, we started on time tonight. Uh, I got something I'm going to read to you. It's in the uh, uh, Sword of the Lord newspaper that I get. And uh, I thought this was really, really interesting. Let me, let me find it here, okay? And I'll, I'll read it out to you uh, for what's a happen. But it says, uh, the guy who wrote this is Matt Staver. Uh, he's the founder of Liberty Council, okay? Uh, like I said, it's in the Sword of the Lord paper. But his title of his article here is, Where in the World is This Happening? All right? This is what he's got here. He says, churchgoers lose jobs because they attend a certain church. Pastors are arrested. Churches are threatened with being bulldozed. Seen in churches prohibited, and home churches are banned. Can you guess in which country this has happened? If I describe for you the conditions of churches in the country where only government-authorized churches are allowed to open, in-home Bible studies and fellowships are banned. Pastors are arrested for preaching. Churchgoers lose their jobs for attending a church service. Uh, some areas police block the entrances to church buildings. Churches approved to meet must display a badge on their building. Churches are threatened with being bulldozed for having more than 10 people in attendance. You would probably think I was discussing some communist or militant Islamic or anti-God country. All these things can and do happen every day to persecuted Christians and religious minorities around the world. The things, I'll skip the pages here. The things I described above are happening right now in one or more of our legal cases right here in America. Liberty Council currently has five federal lawsuits filed on behalf of churches in Maine, Virginia, Kentucky, Illinois, and California. In Maine, churches must apply to the state government for permission to operate. Wow. Only churches granted a state-issued badge of approval are allowed to operate. The badge must be displayed on the outside of the building. In Virginia, a pastor was arrested for having just six people, more than allowed by the governor's illogical 10-person order at a Palm Sunday church service. Police officers remained stationed in the church parking lot to warn prospective attendees away. In Kentucky, 14 people were put on mandatory 14-day quarantine, the equivalent of house arrest for simply attending a drive-in stay in your own car Easter Sunday service. As a result, many of those church goers lost their essential service jobs and have been unable to find new work. In Illinois, the state and local governments targeted Romanian immigrant churches, towing the cars of neighbors around the church to gin up hate and resentment against the church, using 
police vehicles to block the church parking lot, even threatening to seize and demolish the church buildings should the church meet with more than 10 people inside. In California, all religious singing and chanting is banned. In 32 counties, representing 8% of the California population, people cannot worship in church, including a ban on Bible studies or fellowship in their own homes. Wow. You would think I was talking about repressive countries where such things happen every day and believers have been driven underground into secret meetings, yet these are just a sampling of the restrictions and abuse that's happening in America. This does not include the outrageous stories we have heard from the approximately 2,000 pastors in 44 states when we are counseling on navigating their own state and local officials' unconstitutional edicts. Edicts. I think I pronounced that right. Yet at the same time, nearly all of those tyrannical state and local officials have endorsed and encouraged the non social distance and often violent rights tearing America apart. We don't have a problem with thousands of some people burning and looting and stuff like that. But let 10 people meet at church and we got a problem. I just don't problem with that, folks. I mean, that, that, I read that this week and I thought, I knew it was bad. I didn't realize how bad until I read something like that. I thought, wow, that's just, that's unbelievable. So uh, please remember, you know, uh, some of these other churches, he, he said he had about 2,000 churches and, and preachers that they're trying to help right now. This is in America. So do remember those guys in prayer, you know, the churches in prayer. Uh, I mean, well, we are blessed uh, here in Upper East Tennessee with what we've been able to do and so forth and uh, I'm thankful for our local uh, elected officials that you know, they're doing the best they can but at the same time they're, they're letting us uh, do what we think is, is right and acceptable and I'm thankful for the governor. I mean he's been uh, very good about trying to help us out so I, I'm thankful for that so uh, do remember those uh, guys in prayers and those churches in prayer. Uh, I do have uh, <clears throat> a lot of folks on our prayer list uh, several folks They'll be going to have uh, uh, tests and so forth, and some having surgeries this week. Uh, I do want you to remember Brother Doug Graybill. Uh, he's going to have his knee replacement surgery tomorrow. So please remember Brother Doug uh, in your prayers. That'll be uh, tomorrow, I think it's afternoon. So do remember him. And then uh, also Sister Ruth James has got to go this week uh, for a checkup on her eye. And remember a, a man by the name of Charlie Gardner. He's got a stomach mass. Going to have that checked up this week, so remember him and Pat Lowe that had the uh, stress test of the heart. Remember her in your prayers. And then uh, Reverend Glenn Keller, uh, he's from the uh, Glenview Christian Church, a uh, preacher there that had the heart attack. Do continue to remember him. And then uh, Willie Hosbaugh, of course, you remember Sister Willie in your prayers. And then uh, Terry McNeil, uh, remember her. She's had a, a lot of problems, a lot of issues physically going on last few weeks, but you remember her in your prayers, also her sister, her name Annie, and then uh, Dan Perry, Phyllis Todd, I think she's supposed to go uh, the 4th of September for a uh, doctor's appointment on her foot, so do remember her, and you remember Ruth Sell, she's at home doing therapy, and then uh, of course we mentioned uh, Judy Pettit a few moments ago, do you remember her in your prayers, and then uh, can you remember uh, uh, Sister Nail, uh, she is doing a lot better, but please remember her. Remember Sandra Crow, she's supposed to go this week on her finger, and also her Aunt Ethel passed away, so do remember her family in your prayers. And then uh, Patricia Collins, uh, this is Carolyn Campbell's sister, uh, she went to the lung doctor this past uh, last week, I'm sorry, she goes tomorrow, so remember her in your prayers, they're concerned there that she may get uh, she may have cancer, so please remember her. And then uh, Elsie Evans was with us this morning, but uh, she's supposed to go have her esophagus stretched on the 25th. Steve Eastead is due to take his uh, chemo treatment for cancer. So remember him also. And then uh, Terry Chambers, this is uh, Keith Wilson's nephew. Uh, remember him in your prayers. And Joan Miller, that's uh, Kayla's aunt. Uh, can you remember her? And then uh, uh, Shelby Calhoun, can you remember Shelby in your prayers? She had uh, those places on her back. And then Jimmy Carswell, uh, she's got blood clots in her lungs. She did get to go home, is doing better. Remember her in your prayers. And then Jeanette Glover, and then uh, uh, she's got down here, uh, Greg Lentz, his uh, great niece, Ensley Morgan, has got to have brain surgery this week. So remember that little girl in your prayers. And a little older than that, we requested prayer for. They moved him down to Atlanta. Uh, he's a little first grader up at uh, Clouds. So remember that little fella. And of course, the family of the 
with John Matheson, and also Brenda Harvey, and uh, John's brother, Jim, uh, his wife, John's wife, and Jim's wife, all of them are doing much better. Uh, they're all not exposed to this COVID-19, but are doing uh, much better. So we will leave all of them uh, in prayer. We are Brenda Hester. We pray for her family. And then Camille McCall. Uh, that was the lady I mentioned to you this morning that got bit by the copper hook. Uh, ended up going to the hospital. Didn't know what was going on. Well, I should say they treated her for the copper head bite, and she started having headaches. She went back to the hospital, had an MRI, they found a mass on her brain. And they removed that uh, Friday, and the Lord said that uh, they're real concerned that that might mean malignant. So we remember her in your prayers, too, especially if it goes back uh, sometime this week. So we remember her. And then uh, she had a couple others uh, that were real sick. Uh, Paula Holly, uh, that's her niece, and then uh, Casey Waters. Doing all right now, but they were concerned that she may have had the COVID 19, but she was not. So we can remember them uh, in your prayers. It'll be good to see Brother Larry back with us this morning. Uh, he said, Brenda's still trying to get her feet and uh, legs back under. So uh, we remember, uh, can remember Brenda uh, in your prayers. I've got several here uh, that did the test with uh, COVID. Uh, some of them, I think, are now over their quarantine and doing much better. So we remember them in your prayers. And then I saw. Show up, and they'll have. I think he said, if I'm not mistaken, they're going to do another round of antibiotics with them and go away. So we remember him in your prayers. I'm praying that that's, everything's all right there and they can leave that alone. He, he feels good, he feels fine, but he's just uh, really concerned about that. So remember him in your prayers tomorrow. Of course, I'll get there tomorrow afternoon. Anybody else? Got a question? Already calculating 30 minutes from now. <laughs> I can fail. I can fail. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven.
heaven, we thank you so much for all you do for us. And Lord, it's good to have folks with us today. I know my church family has come out to be with us here on Sunday night for our service. Uh, Father, as always, we're just thankful for being in the house of the Lord. Thankful for those that have joined us on Facebook. Thank you for those that may be out in the parking lot listening. Father, we thank you for them. Uh, Lord, we just pray now for each and every one of these requests that they have mentioned here. <clears throat> We've got a, a lot of folks already suffering in our community. That's why I know we didn't mention our prayer request, but a lot of depression going on, a lot of emotional and psychological stress happening. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd be with those folks. I know it's been very tough uh, during this time. Uh, Lord, we continue to pray for the, the request of prayer. We've got some tomorrow. Uh, Brother Doug has got to have some knee replacement surgery. Brother Al tomorrow uh, has a life coming down. Father, I thank you for both those men. And Lord, I pray that you need God to direct those that work with them procedures that are very successful. Uh, Father, we're praying hard for Brother Al. We pray that tomorrow they don't find anything and they tell him things are fine and they don't have to mess their necks up at pay structure. Father, I pray uh, that you give him that re uh, request of his heart tomorrow. Uh, Father, we pray for Sister Judy. Uh, she's on some help. We learned that she's having to be taken uh, to the medical center. Uh, Father, I pray you get involved in that situation and then just give her the touch from heaven that she needs and give her a peace comfort of heart and a comfort of mind. Uh, Father, we continue to pray for Dorothy Smith. I know that uh, she had to go in the hospital. Father, I pray that you continue to be with her. And Lord, we got so many uh, that this week, some have uh, procedures coming up, uh, doctor's appointments, some that are still sick. Uh, Father, I pray you get involved in their situation. And Lord, I pray now that you be with us tonight. Use us as a vessel. Speak to us as only you can as we continue in our study in, in, the, in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Father, help us to learn from you. Help us in the days ahead. Father, we do continue to pray uh, for our nation. Uh, we read off some things there a few moments ago, things that are happening around our country, uh, against uh, churches around the country. And Father, I pray uh, that folks would realize that when we do things like that, that all you're going to do is to incur the attention and the, and the wrath of a holy and just God because we will get involved if you start blunting or trying to stop the gospel. Uh, we will not bless if we do those things. But Father, I pray. Those governors and those officials, and those leaders, uh, wise up in a hurry. Uh, or they're going to incur the wrath of a holy and righteous, just God. And Father, I pray you continue to be with those pastors and those churches and, and to help them uh, they try to navigate through this. Thank you for the blessings that you give us. I'm very thankful for what you've done for us here. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, <coughs> uh, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Picking up with that, I, I've enjoyed uh, studying on some of these prison epistles. I know I've, I've learned some things. It's always good to go back and uh, go back through, even though I've read them countless times. But you always pick up on some things that you may have missed before. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and then I've got here my notes that we left off around uh, verse 4. And uh, of course, Timothy, uh, the Apostle Paul and, and Silas originally started the church at Thessalonica, but you know, we're had to leave. They can go somewhere else and we're going to come back to it. The, the problem was if they came back to that church, then they would incur a, a lot of problems from the, the local people that you know got mad at them for starting the church in the first place. In other words, uh, some of the Jews that uh, on San Adrian Court, the Pharisees, that didn't want him back. You had the, the uh, uh, Hellenistic pagans, uh, the Greeks that were around there. And Paul said, you know, he said, maybe if we go back, we're going to draw negative attention. But if we send Timothy back to pastor the church and, and, and get him ready, he won't draw the attention and be able to win folks to the Lord. And, and what you're seeing the Apostle Paul and these guys do is just ex execute some wisdom. And, and, you know, and understand, I go back, and I know I mentioned this uh, last Sunday night, the only positive thing you read about a snake in the, in the Bible is what Jesus said when he said, be wise as a serpent. And that's what Paul and these guys are doing. They're just being smart. You know, we're going to draw unwanted attention. Let's send Timothy back up there to that church and let him pastor it. And he won't draw the attention that we will and see what kind of success he has. And evidently, he had some pretty good success. And uh, he went up there. Of course, the Apostle Paul speaks to that effect in verse 2. He says, he went up there and established, and established you to comfort you concerning your faith. And, and Timothy did some of those things. And he said also, too, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. You know, afflictions are things that happen in life. I know, even though the things I read to you a few moments ago, 
pale in comparison to what the early church, affliction-wise and persecution-wise, had to put up with. I mean, it's not even anywhere near close. And I think those things will get rectified pretty quickly. At least I hope they do. But the early church, they received some really tough affliction. Uh, I mean, physical affliction, mental affliction. Uh, you know, people threatening them with their lives, prison time. Uh, now, back in those days, they'd throw you in prison and forget about you. Okay? And you may or may not eat. I put it to you that way. They just did not, you know, prisoners today enjoy three meals a day and exercise and, and beds and everything like that. Prisoners back in Paul's day got stuck in a hole, basically, and they may or may not have got three meals a week, okay? So a big difference there. So that's some of the persecution and afflictions they would suffer. But, but the apostle says, Timothy's going to tell you, don't be moved by these things. Keep your eyes upon the Lord and continue to serve him. And then in verse 4 he says, For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. Paul said this is not a surprise. You know, even the Bible tells us as Christians today, regardless of the COVID-19, you're going to suffer some tribulation. Uh, make no mistake, he mentions back in chapter 2, uh, verse 18, he says, Satan will be sure to give you some uh, when he hindered them from going back. And then you've got people out there that, you know, don't like the things of God. Like I read to you a few moments ago, they don't care for the church, don't like the church. And they, don't, they don't like the church because the church preaches against sin. Let's just be honest tonight, amen? amen. And they, they don't like that. They don't like to hear sin brought out or mentioned. They won't be able to go continue their sin, and nobody call them out on it. But they, don't, they fail to realize and understand that God is calling them out on it. It ain't just them, it's the Lord. And, and you're going to face judgment for that. And, and, and you wish people would understand and, and, and realize that. So, so we see there, he says, you know, you're going to suffer tribulation. Here's the thing. God always warns. You know that? I mean, the Apostle Paul has told this church, you're going to suffer tribulation. You know, me and Wayne was having a conversation with Nadine uh, before folks, uh, first of came in. And we was talking about things that are happening out there. And Wayne said, yeah, all these earthquakes and some of the stuff that's mentioned, it, it makes you think. And here's the thing. God gives warnings. Noah, when he built the ark, that was a warning to the people of his day and age. A guy builds a huge boat in the middle of dry land. That was their warning. You've got, when that boat gets finished, you better make a decision before it gets done. But they chose not to. Christ gave a warning not only to his disciples, but to the people by and large. He said, one day is coming, if you remember, on his way to Calvary's hill. He told some of the women, he said, the day is coming where this city is going to be destroyed. You're going to wish that you didn't have kids. Lo and behold, in 70 AD, that's exactly what happened. You know, the Bible gives warnings. And of course, in Matthew 24, going back to the earthquakes, they know that. Christ gives warnings. You know, when you see these things happen, make sure you're prepared and you're ready. And the Apostle Paul, you know, when he was there at that church at Thessalonica, he said, look, we're going to suffer persecution. Make sure you prepare yourself. Or make sure if you can avoid some of that persecution, try to do so. Amen? I mean, if you're put in jail, it's harder to win folks to the Lord. Sometimes when we read it, I mean, it ain't like the apostles in, uh, of old or even the early church would, would do things to purposely get thrown in jail. No, they would not. They did not want to do that. They just simply wanted to share the gospel. That's why you see them meeting in homes and so forth in the early church or, or meeting at the riverside as they did when they started one church. They would try to meet places not to draw attention to themselves and invite people to come and, and listen, but they did not intend to get thrown in jail. And Paul's saying, look, you know, realize persecution is out there. You will be afflicted. Take the necessary precautions. Do what you have to do to make sure you get the gospel out. Okay? So he warned them there. They were told. He said, you're going to suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and you know. For this cause, when I can no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. The apostle says there in verse 5, he said, you know, it got so bad because of me that I had to go. Because the church was being severely persecuted because Paul was there. So Paul says, you know, we're going to leave. We're going to send Timothy back. 
That way he won't draw the attention, but he's just as good a teacher as we are because we taught him. And he'll come back and establish you in the faith. So Paul said it got so bad we left and went somewhere else. But he said, you know, Paul said I was concerned and worried. The one thing that you really get out of some of the prison epistles, and your heart goes out to Paul, I mean, it's hard for us to understand because we can pick up a phone or jump in a car and check things out, amen? I mean, if we're worried about someone or something or something like that or some area, I mean, you can watch it on TV and, and, and see what's going on. Paul didn't have that. He didn't know what was going on in the church at Thessalonica after he left. Unless folks sent him letters and told him what was taking place. Paul says, you know, it was hard to leave you all. And I was worried about you. I was worried that the persecution continued. And it got so bad that, you, that maybe you even closed your doors. He says that by some means the tempter have tempted you. Once again, he's talking about the devil. You know, th these folks in those churches at Thessalonica face this, a lot of temptation the same way we do. They had to fight the same devil that we have to fight. You know, the devil does not want any church to be successful. Amen. And he doesn't want any child of God to be successful. He's going to do everything that he can to keep you discouraged, depressed, frustrated, your mind on other things. Anything that he can do to get your mind off serving the Lord, he's going to do. I know when I go out places and stuff, and you know, you have to get things on your mind. You start thinking about things you got to get done, stuff like that. That sometimes you don't realize there may be somebody around you that needs to be spoken to. You got that? Say amen. You know, sometimes you get self-absorbed, worried about things that you got to face instead of realizing that there may be folks around you that maybe need an encouraging word. Hi there, or how are you doing? You know, I was, I was at the restaurant today and, and uh, getting ready to leave. There was a guy and his daughter sitting there eating, and uh, he uh, had a UT shirt on. So I kind of struck up a conversation with him. I said, "Boy, them folks in Florida are whining right now because they have to come up here December 5th. And he laughed. He said, "Yeah." He said, "That's a good positive thing that came out of that rescheduling." We kind of struck up a little conversation there, talked a little bit. He said, "I noticed uh, you've been at church this morning." I said, "Yeah." And I said, "I happen to be the preacher." He said, I figured you were because you had writing on your title. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's a dead giveaway, Brother Mike. If you wear a tie that's got writing on it, you've got to be the preacher or something. But anyway, he said, you know, I told you where I pastored at. I invited him to come. And he said, well, he said, me and my daughter go to such and such church. And he said, uh, last Sunday was their first Sunday morning. Uh, opening it back up. I thought, well, that's great. That's great. At least, at least some others are, are able to open up and get back in. But, you know, this is an encouraging work. You know, it's a chance to smile and, and talk about some things besides what's going on in the world, but talk about things that, you know, kind of encourage each other. But anyways, he, he, sometimes God gives those opportunities. And he says there later on, he says, the tempter tempted you. He says, and our labor be in vain. Nobody likes to work and get nothing out of it. Amen. I mean, you don't want to paint your walls beige, but your wife wanted them painted blue. I get a witness in here. Amen. Amen. The wife said blue, not beige. And you paint them beige. Guess what? Your labor was in vain. Because you are going to be changing those walls to blue. Right, ladies? Yeah, I know you. A very strong right came out of the congregation. That is going to happen. Those walls are going to be painted blue because she said they're going to be painted blue. Therefore, your labor is in vain. And regardless of the things you may say under your breath or the feelings or attitudes you have when you Throw that paint on there like that, you're still going to paint them blue. Amen. You know, the Apostle Paul's like, look, he says, we didn't want to go up there at that, that to your church up there at Thessalonica and start that church, get things going. And then, of course, they run us out and we have to leave. The, the, the other people do. And, and what we don't want to hear about is the church is completely dissolved and we haven't been gone that long. That makes us feel like we did all that work for nothing. All right? And, and Paul's like, that bothers us. Because it ain't, it ain't just so much the people where the church has been dissolved, but the opportunities of winning other to, others to the Lord have also been lost. So I hope what you're getting from the prison epistles, not just from Paul, but from Peter, Timothy, and a lot of these guys, they're thankful for the people that they win to the Lord. But boy, you can tell they're already looking for the next one. That, that was always on their mind. You know, is, is that person getting the gospel? 
Or is this person get, getting preached or at least hearing about Jesus Christ? You say, preacher, why, why would they be so adamant about that? Remember what Jesus said. Spread the gospel to the most parts of the earth. Remember what he told the disciples. He said in Matthew 24, when the gospel gets preached everywhere, I'm returning. Talk about incentive there. So yeah, that, that even though Paul himself did not hear Christ, he heard the disciples tell him that's what Christ. He's got Luke with him. And Luke, as you know, is one of the writers of the gospels. So Luke was telling him, those are things that the Savior said. So Paul knows that. Paul's like, you know what? Then we need to make sure the person on the next street knows the gospel. And the person on that street knows the gospel. And that knows that street. Because the more they reach, the closer to the return of Christ that they are. Tell you what, I don't know how many more farther places it needs to go, Brother Mike. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Maybe there's some place in South America or, or in, in, in Asia or the Middle East that hadn't got there yet. Maybe that's the last place Christ is waiting on. It's time to get out of here. Amen. Now, one can only hope. But we see there, Paul and him, they didn't want to labor in vain and wants the church to be successful. He says in verse 6, But now when Timothy came from you unto us, so Timothy comes back and gives a report, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity. Now, that makes Paul feel good. The two things important in a church. Faith and charity, of course, means love. They have faith and love. Those are the two, that, that's the two things Timothy knows what Paul wants to hear, amen? He knows what would soothe and, and, and comfort the Apostle Paul's mind. He said, I, I went up there and pastored church, taught them, worked with them some, and he saw right off the bat their faith and their love is strong. So he goes back and tells Paul, you know, don't worry about it, buddy, brother. Their faith and love is strong. It's doing well. So what a comfort of mine he received. He says, in that you have good remembrance of us always. Now, he's not talking about remembrance of them personally, but remembrance of what they have preached to them, what they have taught them. Once again, you've got to keep in mind, they don't have cars, they don't have phones, so when Paul and, 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 and those guys left, okay, the church did not have anybody yet, so Paul had to send Timothy back, and Timothy's there. And he's trying to establish it. So Paul doesn't have information coming to him as it would, you know, in our day and age. So he's worried, you know, do they, do they remember what we preach to them? Do they remember what we talk to them about the Lord? And are they remember? In other words, are they hiding the word of God in their heart they might not sin against him, as the Bible says. And the Bible says that when Timothy came back, he said, hey, they, they remember what you taught them. I, I mean, I didn't have to go back over the basics. They knew the basics. And that made the Apostle Paul feel really good. They understand what's important of salvation and serving the Lord. He says, your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. So not only do they remember what they've been taught, they still love the apostle. Okay? And that matters. They still love him and love his work. In other words, if they love him, that means they're praying for him. See, that mattered to the epistles and the apostles. They wanted to know that folks were praying for them. I'm going to tell you something. You can think about Judy. I know she's on her way to the hospital, but she'll be the first to tell you right now. She was thankful for those prayers, how things went Thursday. My cousin uh, out in Arizona, she had no, they, they told her she wouldn't get to have surgery until the first of the year. And, and, and things, she kind of reacted to the, to the treatments they were giving her a lot better than they thought she would, end up having surgery. And now uh, she's cancer free. You know, prayers matter. Amen. And it's the prayers of God's people that really matter. Now we've got a president in the White House, a governor in the governor's house, local guys here. What they need is not people criticizing, but people praying for them. Amen. You know, my hope is, I, this is my prayer, I hope every day that all those folks, regardless of who they are, at least take the time to open up their day and pray. Amen. If they're doing that, then I feel pretty good about their chances and what the decisions they need to make. Amen. But anyways, we, we see that. Desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Then the Apostle Paul in the next few verses begins to say 
Stand fast in the Lord. He says, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Paul says, you know, we were facing problems and distress and persecution, but it comforted us to know that you all are standing fast. You're not giving up. You're growing this church. You're staying together in love and unity and praying for us and hanging in there. And he says that was a comfort to us and really helped us in our faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Paul says, your stand in the Lord has not only comforted us, but has continued to motivate us to plant new churches. Amen? Here, here's the thing. This is how this thing's supposed to work. If you go out and you invite people to church, let's say you invite 20, uh, let's say in a month's time you invite 50 people, okay? And, and none of them show up. Right, so you go out the next month. Instead of 50, you try to invite 10 more. And you invite 60. All of a sudden, lo and behold, one of those 60 shows up. Okay? And you're tickled to death. I mean, somebody showed up uh, that I invited to church. Lo and behold, they come into church and, you know, you're sitting with them. Next thing you know, they hear the preaching of the gospel. The gospel grips their heart and they get saved. Now, you know what that's supposed to do to you? That's supposed to motivate you to go out and get another Go get another 60 or invite another 60. And maybe one of those 60 gets saved. You know, that, that's the motivation that's supposed to happen in the Lord's work. I mean, you get excited when you invite somebody to church and you see them get saved. Like, hey, yeah, that, that, that's, that's what we want to see. And then you go out and you invite some more and hope so maybe another one will get saved. You know, you just keep on and on and on doing it. It gets more and more contagious. And then people around you see that and they're like, hey, you know, they invited that many people. If I invite that many and get one in here, maybe I'll see one get saved. And if that contagion gets about 25% of the church body, the next thing you know, you've had a 50% increase. Amen. Now, that's how that's supposed to work. And the Apostle Paul's saying, you know, to hear about the way you're standing fast and, and serving the Lord, he, he says that really comforted us. He said that kind of fired us up. He said we're going to stand fast and we're going to try that much harder to plant more churches in this area. To give more opportunities for the gospel to be preached. He says in verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? It made the Apostle Paul happy that folks were receiving the gospel and that folks were standing fast. You know, it excites us as a church body when we see a, 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 a person come in and get saved. Amen. And that person is still in church today. Yes. That, that's exciting. That, that really just, it brings joy to our heart. Because we know a life has been changed. We, we go back uh, to Recovering Soldiers Ministries. I think they were here, I think it was last year they were here. And, and the young man and his wife and his three daughters, or four daughters I should say, that family got put back together. And I mean, they weren't hardly, even those that really don't cry that much, they were welling up in their eyes, amen? I mean, it was just exciting to see that. It kind of made everybody in the church, and of course, RSM, you just can't help but be overjoyed to see something like that. And I ran into that young man about a month ago. He was out in the store, and guess what? Had his four girls with him. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm doing pretty good. He said, still working at such and such. Wife's working right now. And he said, we're kind of, you know, he was anxious about the kids going back to school, of course, worried and concerned with everything going on. But he said, I'm, kind of, I'm looking forward to it and, and, and navigating that. But he said, things are going great, uh, preacher. He says, I think they live on the other side of Milligan over there. And he said, things are going well, going great. And he said, appreciate your prayer. And he said, me and my wife couldn't be happy. And you could just tell by the demeanor of those four girls that were with him that they were just happy. And they wanted to stay around their dad. And here's the thing. They wanted to stay around their dad. You know, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm an observant type person. I guess it's because God called me to preach. But I'm an observant person. And, and I just kind of noticed, you know, he was there and, 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 and the girls, you know, they stood right there with him and, and didn't want to leave his side and stuff. It's just like, boy, they's happy to have dad back and dad with them. And they wanted dad to know it. And I couldn't help as I walked away with this smile on my face and really just warm my heart. I thought, boy. That's what you want to see. Amen. Amen. That's the difference Christ can make Amen. in a family. 
That's the difference Christ can make in a home. That's the difference we will uh, end people's lives. So, as the apostle says there, he says, it just makes us happy to hear what God has done for you. And, and the joy that you have serving the Lord, it brings us joy. He says, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face, might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Paul says, look, he says, we're excited, that we're hopeful that one day we'll get to come back and see you. And if there's anything, questions that you've got, that's what he means there, by perfect that which is lacking in your faith. If there's any questions that you have, we look forward to answering them. I like that. That's pretty good there. Paul says, we look forward to coming back. Whatever questions you've got about serving the Lord or things you wonder about, we stand ready to answer those questions. We're looking forward to that. We want your faith to be that much stronger and that much more perfect. We want you that much more fired up to serve the Lord and reach others for the gospel. He says in verse 11, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Paul knew that he was not going to get to go back to that church unless God allowed it. Okay? You know, the Lord's desire may be for Paul to start a church further south in Greece. That's where they're at. The Lord's desire may be they may need to cross over the sea and start a church over in Italy, maybe outside of Rome. And that's what Paul's saying. He said, our desire is to come back and work some more with you, but that's in God's hands. God has to decide whether or not to lead us back this way. If he doesn't, we want you all to know that you're in our hearts and our desire is to be there, but God still directs where he wants his children to be. He says in verse 12, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do towards you. There you go. Paul says, look, not just love one another, abound in love toward one another. That means increase. Increase in your love toward one another. Realize that one day you may be all you got. Amen. You know, sometimes we, we fail to realize we've got to spend eternity together in heaven. You best get along here or they're going to be your neighbor in heaven. Amen. I'm still convinced Cleo is going to be between me and David. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a little nervous about that. And I'm going to hold the Lord to his word. The Lord says we don't go into New Jerusalem until after the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I'm a little nervous, David, because if he's let Cleo go to New Jerusalem and her mansion's beside mine and beside yours, well, we might have a mess on our hands. We may go in there and have a little fun of our, at our expense. I'm a little nervous about that. I'm praying about that. I said, Lord, please make sure you keep her out of my mansion. Don't let her in there until I get there. Anyway, you say, preacher, you're crazy. No, I just believe the Lord. We notice they're bound in love one toward another. Grow in love one towards another. Okay? Like I say, it's true. One day you may be all you got. He says, not only towards one another, this kind of goes back to the Good Samaritan, but toward all men. The wording is important. The apostle didn't say towards some men or toward a few men or toward most men. He said all men. That means everybody. You know, and I go back to these rioters and these protesters. You're not going to win me to your cause by yelling at me. Automatic turn off. Okay? That, that, that's not going to help your cause or, or get me to listen to you, it don't work. And I got news for you. It don't work for about 90% of people. I've been around almost 50 years next month, and I have learned a few things. And I know people don't respond to being yelled at. Can I get a witness in here? Amen. I see everybody nodding their head. Yeah, it just don't work. But now, if you want to draw a response out of me, show me that you care and don't yell at me. Amen. You know, you can state your peace and, and, and do it in a loving way, in a polite way, in a kind way, but at the same time, you need to understand your situation that maybe I can look for a way to help you. Amen. That's how that thing's supposed to work. Okay? But blocking my way to work is not going to get my attention. It's going to get my anger. Right. Amen. We don't do that. Okay? 
We don't sit around and just throw things at automobiles. Amen. We don't deface public property and expect people to be aware of our cause. It don't work that way. That's not how things happen. I mean, let me give you an example. If you recall, in the city of Elizabeth, they, I think they vote on bringing alcohol or liquor in, right, in the city. I remember myself and Brother Al, I think a few of you are out there with us, we kind of protested that. We did. Now, we didn't block traffic. All right. As a matter of fact, we parked our cars down at uh, Nathan's Church at First Free Will. And, and we got out there with our posters and signs on the sidewalk. And I don't, we weren't even on the sidewalk. As a matter of fact, we were in the grass. And we stood there with our posters and our signs. Myself, Brother Al, and a few of us did. And, and we stood there and said, no, we don't want this. And vote no on this ordinance and so forth. And we stated our peace. We didn't throw things at cars. We didn't get in the middle of the road. I don't want to be run over, do you? They'll run over you in Elizabeth, by the way. And if you come up to their car, they'll probably shoot you. Anyways, we didn't do none of that stuff. We sat there, and some people blowed their horns in uh, solidarity with us, and we gave them a thumbs up. Some folks looked at us like we're crazy. But we still gave them a thumbs up and smile too, amen? We love you too. Now, needless to say, they voted it in. That was their decision. All right? People spoke. We didn't get out and ride in the middle of Elizabeth and throw things or spray paint monuments and do stuff like that. We accepted the vote and went on our way because that doesn't change anything about what we're going to do at Eastside, and that is to win the loss. Okay? And we look at it this way. If we win enough people to, to the Lord in Elizabeth and Tennessee, they may change their minds and reverse that vote. Amen? That's the hope that you've got to have. But that is the difference. Okay? So, the Apostle Paul, he says, look, love all toward all men. He says, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all saints. I don't know, but you might want to mark these two verses. Did you catch what he just said in verse 13? Let me read it to you again. I'll do it. To the end, in other words, in verse 12, if you increase your love one toward another and toward all men. All right? That, that is the standard. Increase your love towards your church brethren and sisters and towards all men. If you do that, he says, to the end he may establish your hearts. I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what it says. Un blameable in holiness before God. That is a big statement. You know, I remember when I was studying this this week, and this is one of those things, I've studied the Bible for a long time, but there just sometimes it jumps out and grabs your nose and pulls you down in the text, amen? And that would kind of grab me by the nose and pull me down in the text. Unblameable in holiness before God. Then, when the Bible repeats itself and doubles down, that means he means it. And you see that with the next three words. Even our Father. Who is God? God the Father. So you see a repeat there in that verse. That means I really mean this. If you love your brothers and sisters in Christ and you let that love grow, and you love mankind, and you let that love grow, then you'll be unblameable before God in holiness. That's pretty strong there. Okay? He says, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. In other words, when Christ returns with his saints, he's talking about the rapture there, by the way. You're going out of here. You have done your responsibility. See, at the end of the day, nobody knows your heart but you and God. That's it. And the Lord, when he looks, and I, and I can imagine when he begins to wrap this church out, he knows what's on the heart. He knows what's there. So I, I take it to mean I, I need to make sure that I love the brothers and sisters in Christ and let that love grow. And at the same time, love all men. Okay? Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss the boat or miss the trumpet, or miss the call. I want to be a part of it. 
I want to get called out of here and leave with everybody else. Amen. I'll make sure I don't. God bless you for being here tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, once again, we thank you so much for all you do for us. Thank you for your word tonight and the power of it and the example you left behind for us to follow. And Father, once again, we see the consistency of the word of God. We go back to the Good Samaritan this morning. Jesus said, uh, love the Lord thy God, love your neighbor as yourself. And he we proceeded to demonstrate who your neighbor is. And then tonight in 1 Thessalonians, we see the Bible once again bring that out, how important it is for us to love our fellow man and to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And only love them, allow that love to grow. Father, I pray now that you be with us this week. Grant us opportunities. Uh, you've already granted some, and we appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. Father, we pray that this week that you'll give us some more. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Appreciate you being with us tonight.